Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to business continuity, resilience, COVID, crisis management, disaster planning, anything that's relatable to those topics. Anything that helps you, your organization, or your community plan and prepare for and overcome adverse situations. If there is a topic you'd like us to talk about on the show, or you'd like to be a guest, you can reach me through LinkedIn. That seems to be the easiest way to find me because I am the only Alex Fullick on LinkedIn. So send me a message and I do return all messages I receive. Longtime listeners and viewers, you'll know that I talked about being a presenter at the BCI Virtual World Conference in 2020 in November, and that I hope to have some of the speakers on the show. Uh, and I had a fantastic response to that, and today is no different. We're going to be talking about two subjects. The first will be uh, leveraging artificial intelligence for business continuity, and the second topic we'll talk about is cyber resilience. And I'd like to welcome to the show the speaker and author of both of those presentations, Agni Dipta Sarkar. Agni, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm really honored to be on this show and um, talking about the unexpected and preparing for it. Well, it's great to have you here. I know uh, your hands were full because you had two presentations at uh, BCI. Uh, so that's, that's yes, really tough to do to start with. Uh, because we do have listeners and viewers around the globe, could you take a minute and tell us about yourself, what you do, and how you got um, into uh, all this resilience and business continuity stuff? So um, I, I've been into business continuity for a very long time. My previous roles, I have worked for large corporates, um, HP, HPE, DXC, and uh, managed uh, large um, certification programs as well the world, uh, multiple locations, uh, multiple management systems and standards. Um, today, I am an evangelist and I help enterprises address uh, challenges in cybersecurity, business continuity, privacy, standardization, change, uh, especially when they're on the digital transformation footprint more after COVID-19 uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, I am part of uh, three ISO forums, uh, three mirror committees in India. Um, one is for SC27, which is 27001 and the privacy standards. The second is for uh, TC292, which is uh, 22301, which is the business continuity standard and uh, supply chain resilience. And the third is for risk management. And Apart from that, we met on the BCI World Forum. So I've been working in, in terms of leading the cyber resilience think tank and hence the work on cyber resilience that we did in uh, 2020. Um, I'm also contributing to uh, Cloud Security Alliance, uh, trying to move their, um, their cloud control matrix from version three uh, to version four, uh, as it happened uh, on 14th of Jan when they released it. So, that's a little bit about me and uh, my focus has moved from cyber resilience and risk and into resilience uh, about five years ago. And that's when I started moving into this area and started working on it. Busy guy, you know, contributing to a lot of things. <laughs> How do you find time? <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying my best. I'm, I'm trying my best to keep my head above the water. <laughs> Well, let's move to your first topic at the BCI conference. And that was uh, leveraging AI, artificial intelligence for business continuity. In uh, terms of business continuity, what is artificial intelligence? Well, let's just define artificial intelligence first. We'll, we'll get to BC afterwards. Because some people, when so, they think of artificial intelligence, they're thinking Star Wars, R2-D2, C3PO, and things like that. You, you are absolutely right. And there are many concepts and conceptions about artificial intelligence across the world. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is what I did earlier, is root it in reality. I, I am going to read out some stuff that's written on the Stanford University uh, website. They have a whole um, effort that they've put in artificial intelligence. Um, the standards making bodies are still struggling to come up with a single definition of AI, but AI broadly means uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence, which means there are two parts to it. Artificial meaning that it's not human, it's, uh, it's machine made. And, uh, and then there is intelligence. Now, the, the, so, so to your point, the R2D2 kind of thing is too futuristic at, at today because there are multiple types of, uh, you know, the intelligence that, that we talk about. So in, when it comes to machines, intelligence is all about the computational part of the ability to achieve goals. But uh, the artificial intelligence part is about the science and engineering of making these intelligent machines or computer programs that can, to some extent, or, or, or to a certain extent today, and I'm sure to a large extent tomorrow, um, replicate human intelligence. Though we're not there yet because um, humans think differently and machines think differently, or rather machines compute differently and humans think differently. And it's not only the cognitive part, it's also the ability to process large amount of data to do something. So I, I hope that explains broadly what uh, artificial intelligence is. And today we see multiple types. There are reactive machines, right? There is IBM's uh, chess playing supercomputer, oh, which yeah. is also artificial intelligence, right? Um, then there is, uh, you know, the, there are limited memory uh, devices. There are self-driving cars that are doing this already, right? They're not very intelligent, but they're intelligent about the data that they gather from the video they capture and from other information that they can get like the GPS information and compute that to come up with some decision-making, right? That's, the, that's mm -hmm. what is happening. And then there is something called as theory of mind. Uh, so in psychology, this is the understanding that people and, and, and all of us have thoughts and emotions. Uh, that is yet to happen for uh, artificial intelligence. I know research is going on and people are trying their best to make machines, um, the R2D2 was tomorrow, but even R2D2 didn't have so many human feelings. I mean, R2D2 did, right, to some extent, but yeah, uh, but not so much. Yeah. And there is there is also this aspect of uh, self awareness that needs to happen tomorrow because it's not enough. I mean, there's something that we humans do completely different from machines. We have a huge cycle of self awareness. We learn uh, both cognitively and uh, otherwise from things around us, right? I'm talking to you, I'm learning from you in terms of how you are behaving. You're learning from me how I am behaving, right? That's, that's the subconscious level of learning that we always do. That's not there in the machines, right? So the machine is primarily looking at data and to do some kind of machine learning. That's the, the procedure for the machine to learn is machine learning. And then they would analyze. The result of the analysis could be descriptive in, in you know, for example, what happened. Mm -hmm. Diagnostic, you know, where you look at something and find out what really went wrong. Or it could be even predictive, that is what could go wrong in the future. And maybe tomorrow they could be prescriptive. And that could become part of the intelligence that we're talking about. Would our, or could artificial intelligence see trends or root causes that people might overlook because technology can go down to a minutia level if that we might not be able to? Yes. If it can be computed, yes. But if it cannot be computed, then I don't know, possibly no at this point in time. Uh, but who knows? Some researchers, some part of the world might say, yeah, we've done it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, science is something that's continuously evolving. But uh, from what I know, uh, artificial intelligence is not ready today to do what you just said, do a root cause analysis which a human missed. But if it's about data, and if it's to look at data, for example, when we come to business continuity, if you have the data of, uh, let's say, uh, a part of your network consistently going down, for a human to delve into the detail to find out the computational aspects of what went down, what was right at that point in time, difficult. There is a lot of computation involved. Even the sharpest mind is mm -hmm. required. For a machine to do that, it's a blip. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that's where it makes a difference. Yeah, I've seen some of the screens of uh, network people when they're trying to find an issue, you know, yes. and it's just numbers and in, in, in data. You know, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, to well, me, it looks like a screen of a mess, you know, but of, yes, they can understand it. <laughs> you are so right. One of the big challenges that we have in in resilience or, or rather in, in, in the ability to stand cyber attacks is precisely that. There's so much data that uh, an analyst can easily get overwhelmed trying to figure out 
what's happening or what has happened. Mm-hmm. Even for movies today, the technology that exists is not really foolproof. It's, how do I put it? It's got so much of false negatives. There's so much information. There's, there's a whole effort when people are running what is called a secure operation center. They have to do this whole effort of, um, of, a, sock, of, a, of a signal to noise ratio management, which means they need to determine what's signal and what's noise. They need to tell the machine that. So there is a whole machine learning that's involved. So with uh, AI and business continuity, how do the two come together? Because you gave the, uh, the example about, um, uh, you know, if there's a network problem or a technology problem and AI can go through, you know, all these uh, lines of code and, you know, at a snap of a finger can help identify where the problem is, you know, a, a mistyped IP address or MAC address or something like that. And business continuity though is different. So how does AI help business continuity? In many ways. So if you look at business continuity, you're talking about the ability to, uh, to react to a crisis, to a, a, a scenario where you have a disruption and that disruption has led to a business being unavailable. Right now, to do that, you need to do a few things. Some are physical. Let's say there's a fire and you want to move people. Um, artificial intelligence probably will not be able to move people uh, physically, or probably would be. I mean, you know, we've seen those movies where there's a computer voice that keeps telling people go left, go right, and all that. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but to do that, it needs a video feed, it needs to identify people who are within that video feed. And if there's fire, obviously the video feed might go off at some point in time. But the point is, there is some other data that 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 artificial intelligence can work on during a disaster. Uh, For example, um, cyber uh, attacks. Well, don't go too far into cyber because we're going to talk about that in the... No, I'm not going into resilience. I'm talking about business continuity due to cyber attacks. Okay. Uh, So so there are already tools available which are doing... uh, activities to prevent or to detect or to respond and even recover from cyber attacks. Um, Artificial intelligence, however, can contribute to some physical stuff. For example, if you have a data center, it can predict that uh, there could be a power shutdown because the mains have gone off and the UPS is running at a particular load. And unless you are able to, you know, uh, put additional activities which are going to take care of the load, you might experience a shutdown. It can, it can do that because it can compute the, the electrical power. It can compute the load that the machines are giving it and it can come up with those answers. It can pick up information from IoT that you can install at the data center and take corrective action even. So uh, what I mean by that is, let's say you have a certain amount of load in a data center and, uh, and there's a power shutdown and you don't have any people at that place, you just have machines. You have artificial intelligence, which is designed to to shut down systems because it is expecting a, a it's predicting a shutdown of or, or it's, a, it's predicting an overload of power over a period of time. It can do that automatically. Um, there are others. So if you if you think about um, handing over work from one location to another, you know people. Okay, let's look at. Um, the, the work from home. So you could design an AI which can detect whether or not the people who were supposed to work from home are actually working from home. Whether you, oh, you're... so yeah, it, it can identify um, Alex is working in a, uh, a call center. Is he really logged in really to Alex? our systems? That kind of thing? It can, it can detect your behavior, yes. Is, can that be dangerous? Uh, if used. As of now, behavior analytics is more about uh, very small things. It's like you get up in the morning and let's say 5 a.m. you get on the network and uh, you connect to it. And then you remain connected till let's say 10 a.m. and then you disconnect. And it notes down this fact that Alex lives in Toronto, IP address, machine address, connects at this time, disconnects at this time. 
access is this, 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 and this. And tomorrow, you make a change in that behavior, it can detect that change. Now, what you do with that information is where it becomes simple or complicated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you already have it in Google. Try changing your phone. It will tell you that this is a new device that you logged in from. Are you the same, Alex? Please, you know, authorize, authenticate, and all those stuff. Yeah. That yeah. basically gives you analytics. Yeah, I do that when I, I get those messages when I uh, log in using my tablet yeah. or my phone to the, the yeah. channel to uh, check something or upload a new video or something. So yeah, I know yeah, exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I bought a company called DeepMind, uh, which was a pioneer in, in artificial intelligence. And, and they've been doing a lot of work. I mean, Google's work on artificial intelligence, there are lots of videos on the internet already. And it's amazing amount of work that they have done. Are we at the stage where AI can help? Uh, let's say I'm the director of finance and I know there's been some sort of a disaster, a, a fire, a flood, some sort of outage. Is there a way I can leverage artificial intelligence in what I'm doing with my continuity plans? Like do, does AI yes. say, this is what's happened, so this is what you need to do? Like how so, can so I- So the answer is yes and no. The reason is artificial intelligence is still expensive. Equally it can. But make business sense to do that, not yet probably. Hmm. Um, and also, when I say technically it can, it's not so mature yet. But on a concept, it probably can. It can pick up information, tell you that your business continuity plan of working here or working there is going to give you so much benefit or a disadvantage across your financing models. You could extend all that to AI. But I don't think we're ready yet. Uh, does that link back to what you mentioned at the beginning that we're not there yet? Because enacting business continuity plans, you kind of need that self-awareness that uh, some of those other details that you mentioned, you know, specifics that AI might not be able to pick up on, you know, the human aspect. No, I, that's not the reason why. The main reason why is that AI needs to learn, right? That there's machine learning that's involved. Okay. You need data. Now, as humans, we are not trained to document the work that we do, right? So we don't have a lot of data about how we work ourselves. Where do you get the data? You're trying to design an, an auto-driving car. Yes, you can get that data because you design it in that way. You pick up the car and you, you feed it with information and then you tell, okay, now this car is ready to drive. Can you have, um, can you have an automatically recovering business continuity program with AI? Maybe tomorrow, but do we have enough data today to train an artificial intelligent uh, machine to take those decisions? I don't think so. I mean, we probably have across the world. So let me put it this way. If people came to Alex Fulick and looked at his data, looked at his videos, then probably you would have an AI that can do a lot of work that you didn't think about. Well, with, with AI, um, how effective can it be in disasters? It sounds like it's uh, because it needs to learn, you know, at how effective right now can AI be in a disaster? No, you don't, don't how can leverage it properly? Look at it this way. Look at it this way. If you have a plan, let's say you have a business continuity plan, unless people know what to do with the plan, your planning is ineffective. Today, AI is at that stage. AI doesn't. AI doesn't understand what you need to do with the plan. Can AI do something? Yeah, probably they can do many things, right? In the future, as your business continuity plan gets the AI cover or gets an AI component in it, and you start uh, involving a, a, a machine into the work to make sure that the cognitive part remains human and uh, the the, the mundane part goes and gets into a machine. Mm -hmm. so the first stage actually is automation. Because if you don't automate, you don't get that data. Yeah. Probably in, in five years time, there will be enough automation in business continuity for them to get the relevant data to bring in artificial intelligence. Though there are other methods of getting data, but automation is an easy way or a, or a, or a seamless roadmap into artificial intelligence. So tomorrow's artificial intelligence or tomorrow's robots that are going to work for 
and help you do business continuity um, will probably be so much so far so so good. You can have artificial intelligence in all parts. You can have it in doing, uh, for example, can artificial intelligence do your business impact analysis? Probably yes, because it's computational. But again, can it do it now? Because it does not have so much of information, it might not be so effective. Mm. Tomorrow, you might want to use that for doing your risk calculations. It can, but probably it cannot, uh, given that level of automation is what we've not done yet. Uh, you could probably use it to write business continuity plans because that's not a human activity at all, right? And you might, the problem that we have today is there are organizations who have got tons of pages of business continuity plans, right? Oh, yeah. 150 business continuity plans. And you and I probably know very well, that doesn't work. So what works is probably a two-pager or a one-pager that's in front of the person who needs to do something about it. Think about our future tomorrow, okay? Where AI is able to allocate responsibilities in a one-pager to a person who's part of a business continuity recovery. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, with, with all this extra data uh, that those developing AI are taking from real world experiences and saying, this is what happened. Yes. You know, um, the, here's how X, Y, Z situation in India, you know, let's say where you are played out, put that in uh, uh, AI to help actually get to that point. So right. that AI can help with business continuity down the road. Right. Is that what's yes. happening? That could be happening. Uh, for example, like I gave you an example, right? So let's say there's a, there is a, there's a disaster, there's a flood or there is a, and you know, and, and probably you and I know very well that disasters don't happen linearly. Mm -hmm. You'll never have a fire. You'll have a fire with some people falling down, someone who's yeah. unwell. It's, it's a complicated mesh of a whole lot of things. Now that's where AI can help because if AI is able to detect and, and is able to provide that minimal information needed for recovering your business to some people, I mean, if AI is able to detect that your main DBA is not available because he was involved somewhere else and you've got backup DBA available, it can provide the backup DBA with the current level of work that backup DBA needs to come up and respond to a business continuity situation. Who knows? I'm just thinking aloud. Yeah. yeah that's a challenge. We don't know how to do that, right? If yeah. your main person is unavailable for you to go back to your backup person, there's a whole learning that the backup person needs to do. Yeah, that uh, that <laughs> that bit in itself often gets missed. Someone gets assigned, you're the backup, and they don't even know right. they're the backup. No, no. <laughs> even if they know, they don't know what the main person was working on, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so unless happens. you're the guy who's opening doors, it's quite complicated, right? Yeah. It's not as simple as press one, press two, and press three. It's someone needs to understand the application that guy was working on. Someone is to understand the decisions that person was making. Even if it is finance, people need to understand how the computations were being done. What was the data that he was working before he went off? Right, yeah. I so, see a future of AI helping business continuity. Uh, we just finished talking about uh, artificial intelligence and business continuity. And now we're gonna move on to your other subject, cyber resilience. So, and, and Kurt, sorry, I'm, I'm actually forgetting a piece on this. A curtain raiser, you know, cyber resilience. First of all, what did you mean by curtain raiser? And then we'll move on. What is curtain that? raiser? Cyber it raiser. was called a curtain raiser because that was the first time we presented the results of the think tank or the work that the think tank did. And hence it was a curtain raiser. Okay. That was the first time anyone learned about the work that the think tank was doing on cyber resilience. Now, what's cyber resilience? So, Cyber resilience. Um, cyber resilience is the ability, or rather, resilience is the adaptive ability to withstand change. Right? So, which means if there is change, you should be able to uh, not only respond to it, withstand it, adapt, leverage the disaster, and do something way better. That really use resilience. That's what resilience should give you. So when, you, when I say cyber resilience, I'm talking about everything that's in the cyber 
so to say, definition, which means I'm not only talking about applications, I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about connectivity, and I'm talking about connectivity to the internet. How is cyber resilience different than cybersecurity? Isn't that the same? Not really, because cyber resilience, if you, if you look at all these aspects, right? So we are talking about response, uh, withstand, and being adaptive, right? These three things have to be there. So there needs to be ability to, then cybersecurity is an essential part of it. So let me put it this way. Cybersecurity is probably one third of the whole game. But there are two other parts. The one, the first part is about the infrastructure and the applications. And that's not security. That's uh, how, do, how do applications behave? That's about business continuity. That's about the ability or the preparedness that you need. So that's where the resilience component goes in. The second part is the human element. So the, the, in the computing element, the human element and cybersecurity these three things make up cyber resilience. Is any one more important than the other or do how do they feed each other or do they even feed each other? They, they do and I'll, I'll explain to you how that, how that happens. Let's look at a business. So a business today in the digital world is a function of the applications that they use, right? So let's say you're talking about a retail function, a retail company. The face of a retail company in the digital world is a is an application, right? That application sits in some premises, right? It could be on the cloud, it could be on a data center, but it essentially is in some premises. And that app is sitting on some computing infrastructure. Now, when you uh, when you look at that, when you look at computing infrastructure and and all that, uh, the whole point is that. Uh, you need to have considered these elements as part of the first part of the part of what I talked about, the cyber part, right? The infrastructure and applications. Then there are dependent services. And then there are human elements. Because if if when something goes down, you need people to actually work it out. So there are human elements, there is skill, there is competency, there is expectation, and then there are service dependencies that people need to look out for, right? And finally, there is cybersecurity. So they are not independent of each other, they're all connected because when something goes wrong, all of these will get affected and they're interconnected. So you cannot see them independently from the other and therefore you need to have cyber resilience controls which have cybersecurity controls and other controls that are about governance and management of infrastructure. Who owns, who owns that kind of stuff? You know, that, that whole area is that a, you know, uh, obviously it's partly technology, but you know, who's really responsible for cyber resilience? I don't think we have a lot many enterprises which are looking at that as a single function. Today, if you talk about cyber resilience, it should, it ideally sits on the lap of the CIE because it is about cyber. Okay. Tomorrow things might change because the CIO is focused on. Okay, so let me put it this way: that for every enterprise, computing infrastructure have both uh, uh, an offensive need a, need an offensive strategy and a defensive strategy. So the CIO is all about offensive strategy, right? It's about how do you use computing infrastructure or IT to make business happen. That's an offensive strategy. How do you use what you have? The defensive strategy is how do you protect what you have? Today, because it is about cyber, it still goes back to the CIO, but who knows, tomorrow, you may have a site, you know, chief resilience officer, and that person is responsible for this. But I don't think, or it could be that cyber resilience becomes a subcomponent of the business continuity office. Today, the industry is confused because we are not looking at cyber resilience the way we should be. We are looking at cyber resilience either as part of IT or as part of business continuity. And sometimes it's neither IT nor business continuity and it's dropping mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And even if it is part of both IT and business continuity because they're not collaborating the way that they should be, it's still getting dropped in between. So when something goes wrong, business continuity will say that IT should have got a business continuity plan about it. And IT is going to say that, you know, that's not my domain. 
That's your domain and you should have done something about it. But the truth is that both, you don't need a separate function for it. You just need these two functions to handhold it together. I mean, the COO's office and the CIO's office should agree that cyber resilience is a, is a topic of interest and therefore let's do this thing together. Well, it, it's interesting you just said that because I was going to suggest, wouldn't it have to be um, somebody or, or, or an area kind of in the middle because you mentioned the human aspect, you know, and it, it, cyber, I know we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you about this a little later, you know, is a lot of attacks from outside the corporation, but inside an organization, and you mentioned the human aspect, there's the user element too, that we have to be careful about and monitor and don't give access to, uh, you know, everything, um, right? So that's so the only the part that I, together. they have to work together because the, you see, we have evolved from a period of time. I mean, I've been in the industry since a very long time, since the 1990s, and I have seen how security has evolved over a period of time. Uh, when I started off, the security guy was the policeman. Yeah, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> today, today we are changing because earlier it used to be all inside an enterprise. So you were bounded by walls. You had freedom to do everything inside and you didn't want people outside to come inside and inside to go outside, right? Mm -hmm. That's no longer true. The perimeter is gone. Your, the only way that you can work today is you need an identity that needs to access an endpoint that is going to authenticate on the edge. That is going to allow you access to some compute infrastructure where you will have some systems that you will work on. And those systems will use some storage where they keep some data. This is the story of, the, of, of our lives today. Mm -hmm. So no perimeter. So to say the identity is probably the new perimeter or I mean, who you are is what defines the perimeter. So the world is changing and therefore resilience needs to be thought of, of in a long way. Ransomware, for example, the world is plagued by ransomware. And, and do you know what has happened? Today there are tools that are called as anti-ransomware tools. But it's like those days when we had a security solution for Almost everything, it was like putting a Band-Aid, right? Oh, that part of the network is leaking. You put a Band-Aid here. That part is leaking. Now you put a Band-Aid there. Over a period of time, you've got so many of these that you're actually bubbling and it, it can burst any day. Mm. That's what's got to change. People need to understand that cybersecurity needs to become invisible, not a policeman. So you want to do business, fair enough. Here's how you do business. You want information. Here's how you get information because you're no longer within an enterprise. You could be using cloud. You could be using anywhere computing. You could be using, I mean, think about it this way. Let's say the CEO of a company wants to go and do business in Syria. There are two options. Option one, no, don't do business. Option two, you want to go to Syria? I'll create a secure channel for you so that end to end, my CEO remains unharmed. Yes, that requires investment. And that's where the risk perception comes in. So the whole idea is about optimizing risks. Mm -hmm. How much risk are you willing to take in pursuit of your objectives? If that makes sense, very good. You have the solution. And that's where we need to move from where we are saying security, don't do, to security, yes, let's do it, but this is not the way to do it. Do no. You you mentioned uh, ransomware, and uh, I know because we're seeing it in the, the news a lot more, it's um, becoming a lot more prevalent in the, the business world right now, and everybody seems to be uh, struggling with it. But why is that happening so much during COVID-19? You know, what, what needs to happen to uh, address this increase in, in, you know, in ransomware attacks? So, you know... Fair question. That, that's a very important question, but I have a bigger question to ask. Today you have ransomware, and tomorrow you might have something new. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear about ransomware until a few years ago. Now ransomware is rampant. And for ransomware to work, there needs to be a few things that need to happen. One, there needs to be a program that needs to enter your network. 
in that program has to contact and has to create a command structure to encrypt. So, so two things need to happen. One, an alien program needs to enter your network and your computers. Two, that alien program needs to be able to encrypt. Now, if you have invested in a capability that denies both, you're relatively safer, but that's not what happens because we are still at a stage where the enterprise believes and has believed due to, so, so what happened, so to your question, what happened due to COVID-19? Due to COVID-19, a lot of unauthorized access was allowed, right? Because people did not understand that this is a pandemic. Probably a few of us who have gone through the SARS pandemic mm -hmm. knew what the pandemic is. I mean, I was amazed at what Wimbledon did. I don't know if you read that. They earned more in COVID-19 than they would have if the shutdown hadn't happened because they went for pandemic insurance. They paid 2 million for 10 years or something like that. And now they collected a cool 141 million, Oof. which is 21 million more than the amount that they would have probably earned if they had the, if they had the event. But I don't remember the numbers right now, but still 141 million, large amount of money for a program that you did not do. Hmm. So, so there are organizations on, on, on that side of, of the fence who had thought about it, who had prepared for it, and who were resilient, right? And there are organizations who are still thinking about it and who are still not resilient. I mean, the biggest example I can give you is the Olympics. They stopped the Olympics. They went under loss. So many people, so many athletes and everything. And now they're saying we're going to do the, athlete, the Olympics no matter what. So it's an either or kind of scenario. They're not looking at it the way others have looked at it. Is part of it, uh, part of the issue right now with COVID is so many people working at home that, yes. you know, that, that it opens up organizations to more risk. So cyber is on the increase. Cyber crime, I should say, is on the increase. So let me give you what really happened. So when this happened in February and March of last year, right? People thought it's a business continuity problem. And those who had a business continuity plan, which let's say is about 40% of the whole world, right? Of the connected enterprises, probably. They went and they invoked their BCP. And as per their BCP, up to 25% of their people started working from home. What they didn't count upon is that this requires you not only to respond to, but to withstand as well. Remember my definition of resilience, where I said that it's not enough to respond to, you need to be able to withstand. Now that withstand can be for one month, half an hour, could be for one year. The objective of, 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 of resilience is to be able to withstand. Now when, they, when that problem came up, they realized it's not 25%. They need to have 100% people working from home. Now they did not, so they went out in the market then looked for uh, laptops on rent. A lot of people got laptops on rent and a lot of people did not. And those who did not, they went into the last resort. They said, if you've got a device at your home, connect it and we will allow you in because we need to get the job done. And that's what the, the, the perpetrators realized is a gold mine because now you can attack and succeed at a device that is not as robust as the enterprise would have wanted it. Mm. So the number of attacks that we saw in February and March substantially went to the end point as compared to the, the enterprise. And guess what happened? All the endpoint security companies, they made a lot of money because they came to you and said, we are from Semantic, we are from ABCD and uh, you have, you're going to go uh, you know, to the endpoint that needs reinforcement, here, buy my product. And mm -hmm. people bought the products. Some people saved themselves, some people did not. And that's where the cyber crime went into rise because it's easier to attack an endpoint than it is to attack an enterprise where you would have a, a military grade firewall or something like that, that's sitting there, that's not allowing your traffic inside. And yeah. Go ahead. The good news is that you can take an endpoint and connect it back into your enterprise and have a backdoor because remember I, ex I explained that in early days, you had the firewall that prevented you from the whole world. So you thought everybody inside was safe. And now you have a guy who comes from outside 
who's a trusted person connects an untrusted device into your network and boom you've got an insight into mm. trusted environment so let's say something does happen there is a, a cyber attack what should an organization have in place and what can they do if they do have a cyber attack to help them become more resilient down the road so if you look at it when you're looking at cyber resilience you need to think about before during and after so the question that you asked is about after there's a whole lot of work that you need to do before in terms of preparation and during as the attack happens and then after so one of the big thing that is after that is called recovery you need to plan for recovery before the the whole thing happens so just like a business continuity plan you need a recovery plan which could be part of your business continuity plan for all and but you need to plan for recovery of your critical computing infrastructure so the first thing that you need to do is to identify where your crown jewels are identify who's using them and who would you need to operate them if at all you need to protect them and you know take them to a secure place think about it this way think about it like a movie right you have an attack and you move your precious people into one room but those precious people need to have service uh, other people service them and that's what i'm saying what people who are going to protect your and use your critical computing infrastructure to ensure that your critical services continue to operate so that's the part of the of the recovery so you need to know if you get attacked what are you going to do to recover and then you come to respond should there be an attack how are you going to respond what kind what layers of security are you going to put around your crown jewels so that you protect them some of them may be dormant so if you look at a risk frame, you know a risk matrix so if you, right there's impact and there's likelihood so you will have a you'll have four quadrants ideally right one where both the impact and likelihood are high one where the impact is low but the likelihood is high and then you have one where the, both impact and likelihood are low and then you have the final one where impact is high and likelihood is rare if you look at any event that has happened across the world that has shocked you it is these boxes this is it is these in, you know events in this pattern where the impact was very high the likelihood was very low the tsunami the attack in the us the 911 attacks everything was unexpected so to your point preparing for the unexpected is about that box where the likelihood of an event is very very low but the impact is very very high so when you are doing the re- the response part you need to have prepared for that unexpected element and have had tools and capabilities kept ready which are otherwise dormant and that's when you go and pick up all those and start building your response so things like immutable databases like right? things where, where you only write once but you read many times and it doesn't allow you to encrypt things like that they are very good investment right mm-hmm. uh, because because th- that that's your investment in resilience um things like um you know making sure that whenever you are you are you're communicating across different areas of your network which you have divided based upon how you need them you've got necessary partitions and small firewalls that prevent the communication back the thing with ransomware kind of thing is that it replicates right mm-hmm. you need to detect the replication and stop it in early days we used to take the network out of physically the pc out of the network right that needs to happen now logically you need to have intelligence you need to have the ability to detect you need to have the ability to what i talked earlier about behavior anomaly ueba is is an existing technology people need to invest in that there are technologies called as xdr or extended detection and response where the 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 tool is able to detect an indicator of an attack and then take corrective action automatically uh, and it, it kind of goes without saying that you know you would have that a lot of that would tie into a crisis management team and a exactly. crisis management response but you're looking at it you know from the 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 different technology the cyber part of it yeah yeah i'm looking at it from the cyber part of it that's another part that you you raised a very important point cyber 
crisis management during a cyber attack is not something that we are very good at. That's an evolving area of expertise mm -hmm. because it's the same. In other crisis management capabilities, it is location dependent. In a cyber crisis management, it's location agnostic. It's skill dependent. So the mechanisms differ and therefore the whole thing is a little bit different. The world is still learning on how to do. There are experts, by the way, who I, I see on the internet who advertise and say that they are good at managing cyber resilience, cyber crisis management. Um, and I'm sure they're good, but it, it's a new skill. It's not what we are used to until now. We have a minute and a half left. Can you take a, a minute with any final thoughts on uh, cyber resilience? So in my view, cyber resilience is something that we need to address today. And we need to consider the fact that cyber resilience has to cover all of your cyber infrastructure, especially your critical computing capabilities or your crown jewels. And in my view, um, the methodology that we've been working on uh, is, is going to focus upon and make this thing easy. And I hope the world invests in cyber resilience and manages it right from the top with a lot of leadership support. And on that note, we've come to the end of our show. Agni, thank you very much for talking about artificial intelligence and cyber resilience. I really appreciate you joining me all the way from India today. You know, so you. I appreciate your time and your expertise. And I must tell you, I had a great time. And, and Alex, it has been great knowing you and all the questions that you threw at me. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And to everybody listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.